I know that a lot of you know young man sitting beside me, but for those who don't, I'm going to do a quick introduction. Sue is 18, a young entrepreneur and founder of Solderson Media. In February 2016, aged just 16, he was diagnosed with stage 2A Hodgkin lymphoma. In between rounds of aggressive chemotherapy and being deputy head boy at Hutchinson's Grammar School, he achieved six grade A's in his Scottish house. During this time, he was also working at ESL, which is the world's biggest e-sporting company in influencer marketing. However, his illness motivated him to do something bigger, and in July 2018, Sue launched Soldiers to Media and grew the company to become a six-figure company in less than six months. More recently, he has sat as advanced hires and become Scottish Edge youngest ever winner. Um, I don't know about you, but see, when I was that age, I was not doing anything <laughs> as impressive. Um, good question that I'm still not. So. <laughs> I have, my first question, what was your childhood like? Were you like selling sweets in the playground? Did you have a side hustle? Did, like, were you like a young Alan Sugar? Like, what was, what was that like? Uh, I actually did nothing of that when I was younger. <laughs> uh, I was just kind of normal kids, really. Um, I was kind of privileged to be sent to a good school, had a good upbringing, but I was never really interested in business or entrepreneurship up until uh, secondary school, so I was never really, uh, well, as you say, selling sweets in the playground and things like that. Uh, I was always mu much more academic uh, on the side, and parents always ingrained in me from a young age to work hard and you know do well in studies and things like that. Uh, so I was never kind of on the creative and entrepreneur side. Um, and I also wanted to be a doctor, uh, follow my parents' footsteps up until, uh, so I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon up until age, around age 13. Uh, was when I kind of discovered online media, business, uh, the internet and how I can kind of turn my passion uh, into uh, making money type thing. So that was when it kind of the turning point was kind of there. But as a young person, I was never really involved in that. That's really interesting. I just kind of assumed that it would be something that you, you grew up with. Um, want to get right into it. Um, can you tell me about the months before your diagnosis of stage 2A Hodgkin lymphoma and can you just explain what that is? Okay, uh, so stage 2A Hodgkin lymphoma is a uncommon but curable cancer that develops in the lymphatic system. I learned that off my heart from the NHS website because I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the uh, lymphatic system is kind of part of your immune system. Am I getting this right? Yeah, okay. I'm asking because I don't know so. Uh, and so I. Uh, at the end of 2017, it was kind of around the end of near, sort of New Year's Eve, I felt a lump in my neck and I kind of brushed it off as if it was nothing because when I was four I had a similar lump in my neck which was just a gland that I had to get removed and everything was fine. Uh, so I kind of just brushed it off and then as kind of the months went on, so in January, more lumps in my neck began forming. Uh, this lump continues to grow and expand and there's clearly something up. Uh, so my dad was a doctor so we went to the hospital and um, they, they weren't really sure what was happening either, so I went under, uh, underwent a coronoid biopsy, which is where they sort of they inject a needle and pull that little, tiny little bit of the chunk out of my neck uh, to kind of do tests, see what it was, uh, and then from that there was no result, so I had to undergo an operation where I was put to sleep and they cut out a full, one of the full glands out of my neck, uh, and then in February, uh, February 23rd actually, uh, I had to go to an appointment at the Beatson, and I, I wasn't really sure as to whether it was, I, I thought because it's a beast it's probably going to be something to do with cancer but the person who diagnosed me doesn't simply deal with cancer related things so it could have been different uh, but that day he diagnosed with stage 2 post lymphoma so yeah. Wow. Um, how did you feel when you got diagnosed because um, I'm 26 and I can't imagine dealing or processing that at this age. You were 16? Yeah. So, kind of, what was the thought process? How did you, how did you deal with that? See, I kind of prepared myself for the worst because I'd done a bit of research as to what it could be and just thought, kind of prepare myself, right, so it could be, end up being this. Uh, and I guess on the day, I wasn't really sure what was going on. I was just kind of listening. He, he just said stage 2 also the phone. I said, I actually didn't realise it was cancer at the time. Okay. And then when I found out, just a state of disbelief because I don't really... I was like, how could a 16-year-old guy who leads a fit, healthy life 
um, possibly get diagnosed with cancer. Um, so it was like really a lot of disbelief and um, but I just tried to kind of stay strong and push through and not let it affect me mm-hmm. um, and just act as if it was just kind of a challenge that I would overcome in the future. Wow, that's amazing. And did you start um, treatment right away? Like how, what was the process for being treated? Uh, so I had to go through a PET scan and a CT scan, which was what told me what stage I was at. So there's sort of stage one to four, uh, so that told me I was stage two A. And then in March, I think, I don't know, March 9th, I think, was the day I started my first chemotherapy. So quite swiftly after I was diagnosed. And then that lasted six months, so from March till August. Um, so it was once every two weeks on a Friday at the beach and uh, six cycles, which in turn translates to... 12 chemotherapy sessions uh, from March to August and then yeah that was how it was. Wow sorry I just yeah it's still a hard process. Um, so you're going through pretty aggressive chemo, you're setting your hires, you're deputy head boy, kind of got a lot going on and you think I'm going to start a business. Where did that idea come from and was Solderson your first business idea? Uh, so as I, as I mentioned before, I started getting involved in sort of online media entrepreneurship at age 13. Uh, so it was kind of at age 13 when I, I uh, got to know a bit about the YouTube business space and the YouTube industry. Mm-hmm. And it was there that I discovered what's called a YouTube multi-channel network, which are content providers which you can monetize YouTube channels and take a percentage of the revenue uh, in turn uh, for providing them services. So that's where I was kind of developing learning new skills and experience uh, from about that age 13 until uh, around age 17 and then I got a job at ESL at the end of 2018 and I was working there from January until June and then I was working that job, I was loving it and I thought that with my diagnosis, I, my kind of mindset was that, I, I don't know, I, I was, I was a curable, it was a curable cancer, I thought that I had a pretty high chance but I thought if I'm in that 15% that's not going to come out on top then I want to go out doing something that I'm really passionate about and make a name for myself in the little time I have left. So it was from that that I left ESL and I always knew I was going to start a business based on influencer marketing because that's what I was doing at ESL. And I noticed that there was really no one doing it in Scotland. Mm-hmm. I still can't find any other influencer marketing agency in Scotland. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong places, but I've yet to find one. Um, I noticed a gap and I thought that I'll go and start that. So quite swiftly out of June, because I had the contact base I built up since I was 13, um, I uh, started social media from that just because I wanted to go and do something uh, that I was passionate about and something big. Wow. Um, and just quickly, could you tell us what Solderson Media does? Yeah. Uh, so my company is a talent management and influencer marketing agency. So what that means, I'll kind of give an explanation on both sides. So uh, one side is the talent management and one side is influencer marketing. Uh, see. So on the talent management side, we manage a set of uh, social media influencers, so that take that be your YouTubers, Instagram personalities, Twitch streamers, sort of people that we look up for our entertainment purposes or the millennials and Gen Zs look up to for entertainment purposes. And then on the influencer marketing side, is it's a new sort of type of marketing that's all driven through social media and word of mouth. Uh, I think about celebrity endorsements where a brand with utilize a celebrity but instead of that they're utilizing a social media influencer to push their products or services so through different types of sponsorships activations youtube videos etc we put uh, help brands work with a set of influencers that we've grown up they uh, grown a network with uh, and the brands would uh, utilize those influencers to promote their products uh, with us and right now it's kind of mostly uh, based on gaming and esports influencers because that's kind of the path i've come through since i was younger uh, but I'm kind of branching out into other verticals like entertainment, tech, lifestyle influencers, so we can cover sort of the whole market as opposed to just setting yourself in kind of endemic brands. How, um, how big is your team? And um, you also grew your uh, company to six figures in less than six months. How did you do that? Uh, so I have two freelance, I, I'm right now based on freelance, so I have two freelance staff based in England who do the kind of influence marketing side and then one of my friends is in the audience kind of he runs his own sort of uh, web development he's saying it there and, <laughs> and he's he's helped me a lot with kind of the tech and the website type things so yeah. uh, he's he's done that so there's two people in england who 
do the same thing as me basically working in influence marketing and all the campaigns, managing talent, social media talent to sign, uh, social media brands, etc. And uh, in terms of the growth, so I just basically is all really come a lot, a lot of it's been outreach. So in the first six months, I just hammered away at outreaching to different brands. And I already had kind of a big contact base from that I'd grown from ESL. And one good thing about this industry is that everyone's really um, works together and connects so you can collaborate in campaigns with other agencies. So working with ESL and other brands, I'm able to jump on their campaigns and pitch my influencers for it and working quite high budget uh, campaigns uh, with them that have helped grow uh, the company to those revenue figures. Um, okay, so this one I'm going to be taking some notes for. Okay. How did you balance school, six figure business, exams, <laughs> being deputy head boy, and chemo? What are your secrets? So, uh, deputy head boy came after the chemo, so that can okay. be taken out of the equation. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, that one last thing. Because uh, I, I finished chemo in August and went back to school in September, well, August, September time, so that started after. Um, so I was I had a lot of days off school because of recovering and for going to chemotherapy. So I guess that took a bit of this away from me actually having to go to school and gave me a more more time, I suppose. And uh, when I was in the hospital, didn't really have anything better to do. So I would just had my books out <laughs> to study to try and take my mind away from um, I guess the chemicals that were getting pumped into me. Uh, and then obviously I had days off from school, so I was just sit in my room and just in my laptop and just work away at it because it, it was a thing for me was that it kind of took my mind away uh, from what I was uh, going through because the business was a real thing that I was just really passionate about so if I was just thinking about doing that and working on that then I wouldn't think that I'm going undergoing what I'm going through just now uh, and I always try when I when I do do what I'm working on I always try and like block out a little bit and just hammer away at work as opposed to uh, sort of doing a lot of things at once so I just like so block it maybe two hours and just work away at something from that and take my break etc so um, that's kind of how I did it and obviously my fingers still worked even though I was kind of deceased in my bed so I could still <laughs> work away at stuff. Wow. Um, so you have a really resilient mindset then, how did you build that up? Like how Again, I don't want to keep like harping back to how young you are, but you know, you're you're seventeen, you're going through chemo. How do you have the mindset of just to keep going and to keep that focus? Uh, I think positivity was the biggest thing. I did a speech at school actually, um, last year. Well, yeah, two thousand eighteen. And I had six key things that I took out of my experience, uh -huh. and the sixth one was positivity, which was the biggest one. Other things, I just think having the positive mindset that knowing, uh, counting down, well, one more session, two more sessions, like you were there, I'll be all over, I'll be all done, and I'll go back to having such a good life. And it's going to be only a short time, it's only six months of my life, I'll have plenty of years in the future to do all the things that I'm missing out. So if I just keep working through and pushing through it, then I'll get through it, and things will be really good on the other side. And if I do something really well in this six months, then I'll have a really successful future in that. Future, so yeah. Amazing. Please ignore the technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, your mum and dad are here, and lots of friends are here. Um, how was their support during that time? And did your mum and dad and friends think you were slightly crazy for starting a business? <laughs> um, firstly, I'll talk about parents. Um, they've been amazing for the whole thing. Um, I don't think I could have got. Do you know? Well, yeah, I got through without them, to be honest. Um, so crying on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, they've just been absolutely amazing. Just everything that I do, even if I think it's crazy, they support it, always been there for me. Um, helping me actually uh, with everything, taking me to places, taking me events, driving me everywhere I need to go, and giving me advice because obviously they've been through a lot in their life and things like that. So they've just been amazing through the whole experience. My friends, I didn't tell a lot of them about what I was going through. I think I only told maybe three for a long time about... I didn't, I didn't really want to tell many people about my experience. Like, so, I, so I think I only told them about three people right at the start. And then I about gradually, business? No, about, the, about, the, about chemotherapy. Actually, my business no one really knew about for a while as well until that kind of came out. Uh, I didn't really tell people much about it. But then when it all came out... A lot of my, I don't think my friends really understand what... Some of them don't understand what I still do, to be honest. Um, a few of them have got it 
But um, yeah. let's name and shame who doesn't understand. I'm looking at Luke Bosey at the back. He has no idea. That's why I'm sitting at the back. He always used to question me as if I was doing dodgy stuff. To be honest, <laughs> um, but uh, they've they've also been really supportive and just through the whole like the whole health experience they've been there for me. Um, and they're all very supportive of the business and what I do. Really nice about it. So they're good good set of friends. That's good, that's important in life. Um, and it was such lovely things that you said about your parents. I've um, had some time to speak to them. Yeah, I'm about to pay um, again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm getting that now, but when I go home, they'll be getting something different. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've been in remission since September 2018. How was it feeling to get that, that news? Was, were you relieved? I mean, obviously. Uh, yeah, it was uh, the best, best, probably the best day of my life. Um, I kind of thought that after kind of well, August 17, if 17 was my last chemotherapy and since then nothing seemed to be going on, everything was kind of fine, I was just kind of recovering. Um, but actually getting that news on that day that it's all clear, I'm in remission. Um, and the chances, and I'm, I'm, I was put in a group where the chances of it coming back are extremely slim, so there's, uh, there's, there's people who it'll be really likely, there's other people you know, who maybe I would put the chance really unlikely to come back. So it's just such an amazing feeling to walk out of there and realise that I'm done. Don't have to go through any of this again. Uh, hopefully never again in my life. And it was just honestly such a such a good day. Do you feel that since you've overcame cancer, you're in that slim chance that you'll never get it again, that you can now do anything, conquer the world? Well, I, I, I try to think that kind of the whole time through going cancer, I was like, if I can get through this and I can get through anything, that's kind of what I feel when I'm going through a tough challenge. I think to myself, I got through that, I can get through this and it's fine. So, yeah, definitely. Amazing. Um, you have some pretty big names behind you in your business um, as mentors and advisors. Can you please uh, share, if you can, who they are and um, how you managed to get them on board? Okay. Uh, so there's three kind of main sort of just advisors who aren't really industry specific and then there's a couple of other agencies who are not explain how I got sort of in touch with them who helped yeah. me so uh, one person is Frank Skywington who's ex-CCO Skyscanner so my school rector actually put me in contact with him and nice. um, so Frank I think went to a competing school of mine uh, St Al's back when he was younger and then I think the rector is uh, trying to chat to him to see how he can boost enterprise in Hutchie. Uh, so he thought it would be uh, valuable for me to organise a meeting with him. So since then, uh, I've just been in chats with uh, Frank and he's been helping me in terms of my value proposition to big Scottish businesses. And he's going to help me put me in touch with big names at places like Skyscanner if I want to ever pitch to big Scottish businesses and things like that. Um, next person is Jason Beckwith. Uh, he's a family friend of uh, my, my family so he's a, he runs a company called Evolution Executive Search so it's a headhunting firm uh, for life sciences and biopharma industries and uh, I did an internship at his company and then I spoke to him about the fact that I was interested in starting a business and he's been giving me a lot of help in terms of business structure, pricing uh, and different things like that and he's, he's been an amazing help, he's always there just if I ever need anything he's just he, I can just email him and he'll have a meeting with me and he's you just give me some support. And then the third person who's helped, uh, helped me quite a lot uh, now is a guy called Kenny Wallace. And um, we did a young enterprise at school and he was one of the judges. And uh, I think the person who's running enterprise for our school put me in touch with, I told him about my business, we had a chat about that. So he uh, has kind of been an interim business advisor at sort of companies that have been $2 billion turnover. So like Heineken and Tesco are two of the ones I think he's been a business advisor at. And he's helped me get in contact with a, a lot of people. So with TEDx Glasgow, actually, he's put me in contact with and just given me a lot of um, information and advice on, on things like that. Then in terms of industry specific, uh, so there's the biggest uh, influencer marketing agency in the UK is called the Goat Agency, and they're a fifty million pound business. Goat, the go Goat. As in like, like Goat is in the animal, but it stands for greatest of all time, uh, uh, like the acronym. Okay. Um, and, and anyway, so I, when I 
won the Young Social Media Martyr of the Year last year. One of the judges was the one of the co-founders of the Go Agency. So the person who was running the awards put me in touch with him, and I went into London office to chat with him. And uh, they've been he's been a great help, just involving me in campaigns with them as well. And <laughs> I'll continue, Iris. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, he's been involving me in campaigns with them and kind of giving me advice if I ever need anything. He's free to help me on my journey because he likes what I do and we're doing similar things. And they're all the, the three founders of that company all started when they were young. They were all working at a company when they were 16 and they left that to found uh, the legal agency. And then, and then, uh, that's some Belgian now. <laughs> that's on my face. <laughs> and then um, the next one is, um, the company Copa 90, so they are a big uh, influencing agency that work with a lot of sports influencers, especially around football, and uh, one of their uh, business development staff there, if I meet with him in London, and he's, uh, you know, he's uh, helps me out because he also, again, started when he was young. I think it's a fact that I started when they were young, they just kind of see me and them a bit, so they've always they've been uh, offering to help me and help me in my journey and uh, kind of involve me in campaigns to help grow the business also. Uh, so that's the two for kind of the influence marketing sites. That's incredible that you have such a good support network and people you can turn to and ask for advice um, going on that journey and like you said, people who get it. Um, you mentioned there that you won Young Social Media Marketer. What was that like? Because you won it when you were 17? Yeah, Is that correct? Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, awards that were in London. So it was the Social Media Marketing Awards. And I didn't go to the awards ceremony in London because I didn't think I was going to win. Um, <laughs> and the next day, I... I, I didn't even realise, to be honest, that I had a chance uh, because there was a lot of like really people that I knew that were in the same category as me who were working at these big agencies that I knew that done a lot of really good things and really successful. Um, and also, I was studying for a test, which was the next day, so I couldn't really go. But I woke up the next morning and I just kind of checked Twitter uh, to see the announcement of all the winners who were there, and it was like such an amazing feeling. To That was my kind of first big bit of credibility for the business. Uh, and that has really helped actually that I've got that behind me that people can see oh he's actually kind of credible and certified uh, so that was that was uh, that was a good thing for me so yeah I was, I was 17 well on that one amazing um speaking of tests exams and credibility uh, you recently made Scottish Edge history by winning uh, to being the youngest ever Scottish Edge winner but you uh, had a bit of a clash on the day of your final judging, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the day of the judging was me for the young age was I think May 16th, uh, if I'm right, and in the morning I had my higher business exam. So as soon as I was done that, I, I, I had to just quickly go off to Edinburgh to do the pitching uh, in Edinburgh. Talk about a stressful day, like, honestly. Um, your business is doing really well, you know, six figure, a couple of freelancers. Why did you go for the young age and how does it feel to not only win, but to be the youngest ever winner? Uh, so I don't actually remember how I specifically found out about young age, but I thought there had been a lot of chat about it. Even after I found out about it, a lot of people who were in the business world will ask me to apply for young age, you apply for young age and uh, things like that. Uh, I decided to go for uh, I, well, I, this young age because I wanted to have a little bit of an injection of cash flow into business that I could use that I guess wasn't all retained profits that I could inject into it and use that specifically to uh, bring on more people onto the team and uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to use that for freelancers for a bit of uh, for a technology development that I'm doing uh, for the company just now and then for networking events uh, because there's quite a lot of influencer events around the world that I'd uh, well for me and the team to attend. Um, so I, I, I went for I went for it um, because I just thought that'd be a really sort of good thing to have won. And again, I didn't think in the day, you know how much I was thinking the day before I wasn't, no chance I was gonna win it. Um, because I didn't think I did particularly well in the finals day uh, in terms of pitching, but it was such an amazing thing to, to have won. Um, and I'll definitely be applying for the main Scottish edge in a future round. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, Evelyn, but I'm going to say it anyway and you can give it a laugh at it. Um, but you say that you didn't know if you were going to win. Um, I judged Sue in, uh, Sue in um, the Creative Edge Day and I had watched your video before we went in because I was to, to lead on you and um, 
I I knew from watching his video that he was going to win. I just knew that I was just like, this is incredible. I actually watched it twice because I couldn't believe how old you were. I was like, he's what age? Um, and and yeah, and I just think that um, the rest of the judges were really impressed by you. So um, have more faith in yourself because we certainly did. Um, so. How do you do it all? Because I'm I know I've already kind of asked this, but like do you sleep? Like, do you get like a solid number of hours? Like, what's the secret? Because you also did the school show last week. Um when I gave you your edge feedback, you were down in somewhere in England doing like a tech event. Like, how how? I get a good amount of sleep every night. Like, how, how many hours? Eight minimum, I think. I don't know. I don't know. It depends you say. Um, no, I, I, I make sure I sleep, um, but I don't really know how to, to be fair, like with the business, I, I guess, I guess what every sort of business owner knows, you get as much out of it as you put into it, so because right now I'm doing school, I have all these other commitments, I've only been able to sort of dedicate maybe two to three hours a day when I come home from school and things like that, so hopefully the summer is going to be a chance for me to work proper nine to five hours and put a lot more into it. Um, um, but I guess just kind of find the balance between everything um, and making sure that you still have time for everything, your social, your school, business and things like that because, and kind of prioritising as well because there's things that are going to pass that you're never going to have the chance to do again in my school years, like the school show for example was my last year and I'm never going to be able to do that again. So taking that on my last year was a big thing and I know that a business I'll have after so I don't have to, I was kind of prioritising making sure that I take most of the things that are there at the time because I know I'll have uh, the time over summer or in the future to uh, go on to doing these things and then it, with S6 that's been done for kind of straight after, after exams you don't uh, have any sort of more school commitments in terms of academics so I've had kind of a lot of the free time in there rather than doing show rehearsals to just work in the business and that so skills kind of been done I guess since end of May uh, so I've had the time in that. He's got a secret, he's just not doing it. <laughs> um, but I think that was, a good, that was some great advice there but it's definitely what you put in um, and, and prioritisation and uh, yeah so I'm going to open it up to Q&A, does anyone have any questions? Declan. <laughs> um, one of the things I'm fascinated by is encouraging more you know, younger entrepreneurs and um, having been to Hotchi as well, I think it's a nice, a nice name drop there. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I say about it is almost getting away from the kind of standard path of going to school, university and then a graduate job. How, how do you think we can encourage more people like yourself to start a business and take an alternative route? Uh, that's kind of what, again one thing that I'm wanting to do is kind of encourage young entrepreneurship and taking action as a, a young person. Um, I think kind of just is more, a lot really the safety blanket in terms of school. Everyone's kind of drilled in from the start. Do all your all your exams. Go off to a good uni. Get a good job. Type thing. And I think really only the in Hutchie specifically the enterprise only opportunities only come up in sixth year. And I personally didn't think that the enterprise. I'm not. You know, I was particularly um, sort of in, in, no, but in terms of in terms of in terms of encouragement to start a business, like my friends have all done it. I don't know any of them are going to go on to start a business or going to you know do law or finance or go into a, a job. But I think just putting more sort of um, enterprise opportunities in school that are kind of can lead you on to doing that, not just you know, the ones that are there in S6 that are, are, that are provided, but I think really trying to deviate away from the whole go to school, get good grades, go to university, but actually show that there's lots of different options out there uh, and try and put, put them in the mix of it as well. Maybe me and Mimi to have a chat about SG Hutchie. <laughs> Mimi, that's SG, a good plan. Um, I'm um, it up. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? I have loads of questions, so I can just keep going if you want. Can I ask you, um, the, the specific 
means by which your business makes money. I, I know the general philosophy of it, etc. But how does it actually work? You know, how do you interface, if you will, between the influencer and so on? I, I'm just not quite clear right, at some point. Okay, you know, so in kind of the two sides of it, so with the talent management side, we just are representation of the influencers. So obviously, with that, we're on the donor exclusive contract with us. So whenever there's kind of a deal or merchandising or any sort of opportunity, let's say, just if think about it as like a, an actor or a fashion yeah. model, their agents will take a cut of their earnings uh, from you know facilitating the deal yeah. or leading to that. So that's how it works on that end. And then on the influence marketing side, we're kind of a middleman between the brands and the influencers. So we have the connection because what the, what the agency kind of does in our industry is provide the expertise that the brands don't have because it's a very new industry that brands really know how to capitalise upon mm -hmm. because obviously marketing is always evolving at every single time. So it's with the agency, they have the expertise. So we're kind of the, the middleman and we do the connection between the both sides. So how that would work is the brand would provide us a request or proposal and with that, when they have a budget, we would spend utilise that budget and spend that on the influencer spend and any other spend that may be in there that would come from our side and then we would retain a percentage of that budget as our service fees mm -hmm. for doing the deal so that money comes from the brand side and then on the tap manager side it's a cut the influencers. Okay. Thank you. I've got a question. Uh, so how would you differentiate between a micro influencer or when does it start? When do you become an influencer worth uh, you to contact them or do they contact you? How does it start? Uh, so in terms of the, the naming of influence, there's lots of different kind of ways people try and uh, do it. So it's not really one set, but micro influencers are typically the smaller influencers, say maybe 10,000 to 50,000, or even could be smaller depending on, it all depends really. It's not really the followers that you should be looking at, it's more about the engagement and how they can interact with their fans and get a product pushed across, because that's, it's not really, the, when you see followers and views and likes, etc., that's all kind of what we call vanity metrics, because you see that on the outside, but that could all be bought, purchased, and that's where influencer fraud comes in as well. It's looking at kind of the deeper insights of the engagement of things. And then if on the on the other side, especially mega influencers are like the top sort of influencers that you see. Uh, and then for each kind of brand specification, so when I'm doing sort of the talent management side, we outreach to the influencers, we only say people that we specifically want to. Uh, so we've had kind of requests to work with us, but we are really kind of specific on, so me and uh, my team, we look at who we want to target, and then we look to seek to sign them, and we always do. We always try and provide them a service non-exclusively first to show prove our value and show what we can do for them when we're not exclusive and then come up with a conversation so we've done this for you how can we take that to the next level and bring you on and then when it's to do with the brand side so the brand would kind of have a specification of what they're looking for because obviously each brand's targeting maybe different demographics different ge geography different age groups so with that brand specification then we look exactly so if they were looking for lots of micro influencers and that would be the pool that we were going towards if looking for larger influencers who maybe target uh, tier one English speaking countries then we look at that so it's all dependent really on the specification and what the product would fit best with with the awesome. Um. My day job is actually digital marketing, I don't know if you, you know that, um, and I know you're mostly YouTube, but Instagram are going to start hiding likes. What is your thoughts on that, and do you think that YouTube will follow suit? Um, I don't know, actually, no Instagram are going to start hiding likes, actually. Yeah, um, they're trialling it in Canada. Really? Mm -hmm. um, I know Instagram is very big now for influence marketing as well. I thought the whole the whole thing for me with Instagram, well, that's how it is kind of in my age, is people go post on Instagram to get likes. Um, so I don't really know how that's going to work with kind of my j younger sort of target. But I guess, again, the likes aren't really the big thing. I, I guess if if, if a brand's looking to you know, gain brand exposure and things, then obviously the engagement showing how many likes or comments shows that. But it's more kind of what they're kind of looking at. The real ROI for them is, you know, the link clicks or the purchases. So I don't really know if that will have a big effect unless they're kind of doing a brand exposure um, campaign. And in terms of YouTube likes, um, I I don't I don't think YouTube would do that, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because obviously you've got the like and dislike, so it kind of helps YouTube see what, because YouTube, a lot of the YouTube algorithm is based off what 
the con what the viewers are enjoying. So it's all based off watch time as well as likes and uh, dislikes and engagement. So the likes and dislikes show what they should be pushing to the top of the algorithm, putting trending, etc. So I doubt they would do that, but if Instagram are doing it, then potentially it might be a thing that all social networks look to trial uh, and see if that will work for their platform as well. YouTube are hiding comments though. Yeah. And they're moving kids uh, into its own channel. So what do you think about that? That's that's more for safeguarding of children though really because obviously the comment section can be quite toxic in some places and it's not really good for younger children to see and that's why as well with YouTube kids because they're trying to crack down and there's been a lot of stuff on YouTube with um, uh, harassment of children things like that so that's why they're specifically doing that I think but again the likes and dislikes don't really have much bearing on that but it's mostly the, the reason I've seen that is because of the fact they're trying to safeguard and protect um, children who are utilising their platform to make sure everything's safe for them because that's kind of their duty, I guess, as so well. So it's not going to be like a widespread thing? I, I doubt that would be the case for kind of the over-18 site. Uh, but uh, but then again, obviously, there's always children who will kind of find a way to get through the system. But I guess they're just trying to safeguard as much as possible. And if it does post be an issue, then potentially it could happen in the future. When I feel, nearly I feel him without asking a question, so I feel like I have to. <laughs> um, so popularity of influencers tends to fluctuate a little bit, um, and I know you mentioned like you're you're actively only working with people that you want to. Um, tell me about how you're looking to scale. Like next five years, um, that that can possibly scale beyond maybe. Well, it might scale as you scale your <laughs> workforce, but how do you quantify what? an influencer that you want to work with looks like? Uh, so the majority, so for us, we're really specific on UK in terms of influencer because I want to bring in the UK talent management side and then also because each country in terms of talent management, a lot of agencies are really focused on their country. So there's French agencies, there's Spanish agencies, German agencies. So I want to try and kind of target and bring up the Scottish and also UK sides of it. But in terms of scaling, um, the company, then the talent management side, I don't think it's got really much bearing on that. It will definitely more come from uh, the brand side because that's where the majority of the money is coming in. And in terms of uh, the influencer marketing industry, each year it's growing hugely. It's apparently by 2020, it'll be a spend of about 8 billion uh, by um, marketers on influencer marketing, which is ever increasing. And, there's a survey that was done in this year, 65% of brands increased their spend into it. So because it's still such a new and flourishing and emerging industry, uh, how, I, how we obviously plan scale is mu much more and aggressive focus on working with the brands uh, on that side. Uh, and then in terms of why, the one reason I'm trying to increase my workforce is that there's so much I can, we can do as a small team in terms of the number of campaigns and capacity. And when you're working with really large companies it's really unprofessional if you can't you know handle everything if you're like I, I, for example the go agency one of our clients is coca-cola if i were to work with a three-man team with coca-cola that would be very difficult because of how big you know their scale is and then um, that's one thing that will really help in terms of uh, how we can scale the business because the more people working in campaigns i can delegate that and then you know i can be running one thing while the other people are running other things and that's lots of different revenue streams coming in um, and with that, uh, that, so that's kind of the main side. And then also with the technology that I'm trying to develop, a lot, a big thing that a lot of, there's a, so there's two kind of influencer agencies, talent management services, and there's uh, influencer uh, platforms. Uh, and there's, what I'm trying to do is kind of have our, implement one with us. So where we can, so not, I don't want to become an influencer platform, but I want our agency to have this kind of service so it kind of automates it a lot more so brands can actually, instead of us having to do manually pitch all the influencers, we can just throw our platform to them, they can see, you know, and they can sort of choose influencers based on their specific criteria and they can come up with kind of a short list and then we can track campaigns for that uh, to automate that because if we're able to track campaigns more accurately, then that's obviously a lot better for the brand because they know the exact uh, return investment uh, and not just kind of sales and that coming from brand exposure, engagement and things like that and how much the brand's been pushed out there. I've got a follow-up question. 
You do it to me all the time, so it's fine. I know, I don't like it showing the other foot, though. <laughs> um, so, in startups, we put a lot of kind of focus on product market fit, and uh, we've got a very thesis, thesis oriented kind of um, approach where we make bets, we make little bets, we make little experiments um, on where the industry is looking to go. Then we try to measure that and figure out what what's next. So, are there any kind of little thesis, well, little bits of thesis that you've got on? Where the influencer marketing agents, but where the influencer marketing industry is going within the next five years, and what, what, what are you actively doing to kind of innovate and push push the boundaries there? Uh, so right now, influencer marketing is really business to consumer. It's the main thing is that right now is that brands are trying to push out to consumers and grow their services. But the one thing that I think is going to come through it, and I've already seen this being kind of tested and things, is business to business influencer marketing. Uh, and I'm not really sure, I need to look into this more how it works, but LinkedIn is one place, obviously they've brought in LinkedIn Live and things like that, uh, and I know a lot of other agencies are kind of experimenting, so I think that the main, in, you know, the next five, ten years, business to business influence marketing is going to grow out of that, uh, and I know a lot of industry agencies will probably try to capitalise on this with um, sort of experience in that. Right now it's very business to consumer, so that's, I think, where it's going to go in somewhere that we'll have to start looking at how can we do do this as well. That's a nice edge scale of money spur. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you vet your influencers? So we've spoken about a little bit about um, you know buying followers and likes. How do you vet them? What process do you have? Uh, so when we're kind of doing a campaign with uh, a company, we would send them an initial influencer pitch, and then from that they would choose who they're interested in, and then we only vet those influencers because if they're not interested in other ones they're not going to be used so yep. we vet those specific influencers to save time and check as to you know if there's any false so there's also different sort of websites and platforms out there one of the influencer platforms i mentioned influencer platforms uh, one of uh, theirs so i'm kind of we work with them so we can use kind of their service oh, uh, to kind of see and vet and see their engagement score and uh, tell if their engagement actively matches up to their following and things like that and then we also kind of just look at it manually um, take a look so if one post only got you know 100 comments with you know 20,000 likes and the next post was getting 500,000 likes um, but you know very little comments you can tell that likes are being bought at that point but it's uh, that's a really big thing to make sure because influencer fraud is a massive thing right now that um, companies are trying to see how they can avoid and that's yeah. why and that's why companies tend to use agencies because they have the expertise in how to vet their influencers uh, to make sure that everything's sort of um that it's all tracked and can make sure that it's not any in, in, in fraud going on um, oh, yes, Dennis. so i think it's kind of the next stage from vetting your influencers if you're working with brands and you're working with influencers reputation is key Sometimes influencers can go a little bit rogue, like the Australian rugby player just now. Mm -hmm. Have you had to deal with that, and how would you deal with that? So far, I've not had to deal with that because we're very clear in when we're working with a on a campaign of what the requirements are, and then obviously all the influencers are contractually right obliged to you know do their deliverables. Um, and if it's not the standard of the brand, then they then we always make sure that there's a point where they can redo whatever they've done so if there's any piece of content that they've done and the brand's not happy with it then they can have revisions of it so we always try and put one or two revisions in there for free otherwise the brand would have to pay if they want anything more done um, so right now we've not had any sort of anything go wrong uh, or go rogue but uh, when I was chatting with uh, one Harry Hugo who's one of the co-founders of Go Agency he was it's telling me how there's a lot of things sometimes things go wrong um, and they always guarantee results so we as well try the performance marketing so try and guarantee to our client's results so if that doesn't work then we'd have to take the fall on our side so even if that means we're making a loss or not making any of our margins and we have to make up for that on our side because that's the rest of the agency has to take in the middle because that's their, it's, their, it's their job, it's their expertise so if something goes wrong then it all falls back on the agency so they have to take that and just make sure it doesn't happen the next time and then obviously, if there's any influencers that are later than that, probably would end up on some sort of blacklist, um, which if they've done that before, then it's not likely that we want to work with them again for any sort of campaign. Because uh, I know a, lot, a couple of other agencies have sort of a, a blacklist of 
and the influences I've just it's not worked out with them. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, I, I have so many more questions about influencer, but um, we sadly don't have the time. So you've just left school, you've one young age, you have a six figure business. What's next? Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to go to University of St Andrews in sorry in September uh, to study economics and management for a four year course. Uh, I'm well doing that, running business like I've been doing with school. And uh, but university apparently is a lot less work. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been told first year St Andrews you don't really do much. So I'll have a lot of time to work in the business uh, and during that and then. At the same time, I'm going to see if I can try and make some special arrangements with the university so that they're aware I'm doing this business, if I can, you know, make special arrangements so I can put a big focus on that because I really want to do the business, but I also, again, want to have a university as kind of a fallback option because if something goes wrong, they'll have that degree to fall back on. Although I have this experience, I still obviously want the degree. Um, and then once that's over in four years, um, if the business is still prospering, if we're still going strong, if it's going places, then I'm just going to go into that full time and see how I could take that at scale working in that full time um, and then with the future I don't want to run this business as my main goal in the future I've always envisioned myself to be somewhere like Silicon Valley running some tech giant or something so we'll see how it, where it goes and I'll probably move on and see if I can get into some form of like artificial intelligence or something because that's what I really want to work in some technology type company in the future. <laughs> you can do that from Scotland. We can we can keep you here if you want to. Yeah, and um, you know we would love to do an SG, uh, you St Andrews if you have any free time. You know, with eight hours sleep. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Got it. And um, it's been a real honour to have this chat with you, ladies and gentlemen. Please give it up for Sue.